my talk is about building trust in AI. So over the days, uh, upcoming days, we will have different discussions about different ways to build trust. But today's topic is more about uh, like a general idea of how to build trust in AI and why we need to build trust in AI. So when we talk about AI and especially talking about trust, the first thing comes to my mind is HAL 9000, uh, the evil AI from 2001 Space Odyssey. And of course, Terminator. Um, Terminator who was sent from the future by Skynet, another evil AI. But this is not what we are talking about. We are not talking about uh, evil AI like in fiction, but we are talking about what is we have in our hands, what is exactly going on um, in real world. And the problem in real world is the black box problem. Sometimes we have training data and we train a model which is appearing to us humans as black box. And then we get some output from these models. And then maybe we get really lovely results, but we don't know what's going on inside the model. So that's where the trust issue for AI comes into play. And why we need to answer this, the big why that we have is because if we know what's going on inside, we might know the reasons why a model might fail. And we might also know more about the problem at hand or more about the data. And especially this why is very important when, you, when we use these kind of models in a high risk environment. And how can we achieve that? We have some real world data, and then we can learn from this data, uh, some black box model. And then we can apply some post hoc methods and extract interpretability for human beings. And then we can understand what's going on inside the model. I'll go into these discussions uh, more in detail uh, in later slides. But first, let's talk about uh, AI. Let's see a bit of works of AI. So here I'll talk more about some of our work, which is uh, in AI medical imaging. And uh, to start with this, I'll start with a short video. Sorry that you have to see it again. And this introduces my uh, research work that I have done so far in my PhD in a uh, brief manner. Magnets, they are everywhere. From compasses to credit cards, from VHS tapes to hard disks. Our planet Earth is a giant magnet. Even our body is made up of micromagnets, hydrogen atoms. With the help of a super magnet and these micromagnets, we can obtain internal images of our body without cutting ourselves open and definitely without using harmful ionizing radiations like in city. This is called magnetic resonance imaging or MRI. But there is one problem. MRI is really slow, making it difficult to use during surgeries. We can make it faster if we ignore parts of the data, but that will make the images lose quality. In our research, we are trying to harness the incredible power of artificial intelligence, to be precise, of machine learning, to solve this problem. We are trying to teach our machine learning algorithm how to improve those poor quality images without compromising with the speed of image acquisition. So, now why MRI? We have different imaging modalities in medical imaging. The first and foremost, it's non-ionizing radiation. So it doesn't expose the, um, the subjects, the patients, to a harmful ionizing radiation like in computer tomography. Also, it provides multi-contrast tissue, which I will uh, talk about in a bit. Like this, we have uh, with MRI, we can just tune some parameters and we can see different types of images and focus on different pathologies. So the doctors can choose what they would like to see. With MRI, we can also have something like dynamic MRI, which is basically an internal video of ourselves. And using this dynamic MRI, we can do things like uh, biopsy, RF ablation, uh, MR-guided cryoablation, and so forth. But MRI isn't the best thing in the world. It has also its problems. First of all, patient's comfort not at its best. It's noisy. And it also is quite tiny in terms of the bore, so it can be a nightmare for claustrophobic patients. And it would be impossible for alligators like him to enter the scanner. 
Also, it is really expensive compared to other imaging modalities. One of, one of the biggest problem of MRI is longer scan times. And because of longer scan times, the subject can move during this time and create motion artifacts. And also this creates problems for interventional usage. And this is exactly what I, I worked on. And what is this longer scan time? How can we fix it? The scan time is proportional to the amount of data we are measuring. So if we acquire less data, we will uh, be faster, but then the image quality would be also poorer. And how we acquire data in MRI, just to give a small introduction. The data is not acquired directly in the image, but we acquire uh, in the frequency space or K space. And we uh, apply inverse fast Fourier transform to get the image. To make it faster, if we ignore parts of the data, we have something called undersampling, but we end up with artifacts like you see in this image. Now, this is exactly where uh, our research came into play. And the first thing we did here was uh, we proposed Recon ResNet and the NCC1701 pipeline. In this, what we try to do is, the, the here is you have the network model. Yes, black box model. You supply uh, the undersampled uh, image to the model, which is with artifacts. And the model tries to recover the good image out of it, tries to filter the artifacts from it. But this is the Recon ResNet model, but it's not only it. We also propose this whole pipeline called NCC1701. I wouldn't go into detail because that's not the focus of our talk today. But this just tries to reuse the data that we already have to improve the images even further. And what we got from them, once we um, uh, trained our model and tried to reconstruct. So we have this top row, as you can see, we have uh, five different types of undersampling. So depending upon the undersampling, you see different types of artifacts. And then using our model, we managed to reconstruct them as what you can see on the bottom row, the outputs. On the left, we have the fully sampled image, which is the ground truth. And you can see in every case, we get stunning results compared to what we could have obtained without deep learning using um, traditional methods like you see on the first row. Then we moved into uh, another idea that was complex valued Fourier uh, PDU net. In this case, instead of just trying to remove artifacts from the image, we went one step further. We created a model working in the hybrid space. What's hybrid space? We are working on both image as well as Fourier space or K space. So in the image space, we are trying to remove artifacts. And in the Fourier space or K space, we're trying to predict the missing frequencies. And in this model, uh, on the violet blocks that you see, they are the dual blocks. And uh, those blocks are the one responsible for predicting the missing frequencies. And they are using complex valued convolution, not the typical convolutions we are usually used to uh, when we are using uh, CNNs on uh, day to day basis. The primal blocks, what you see on the bottom, they are uh, working on the image space and they are trying to filter the image to remove artifacts. And this can be understood as an unrolled uh, reconstruction operation where we are repeatedly removing artifacts, filtering, and we are doing it again and again. Uh, and this is how uh, this model works. And what do we get from it? Et voila, we also get good images. You see on the top row again, that's the input and how uh, dirty, let's say, the inputs are. And then we have really nice, clean uh, output coming from it. Now, we talked about um, reconstruction. How about something else? Let's look at something else. Another uh, really interesting work that we have done was uh, for unsupervised anomaly detection. As we know, like uh, especially in medical images, having large data sets is a big problem because the uh, radiologists, they have to annotate everything manually. And it's always uh, a big uh, problem whenever we think about uh, large data sets. And deep learning typically require last data sets. How do we combat that problem? So this is what we proposed here. It's uh, the pipeline is called Strega. In this pipeline, we first supply uh, the input volumes and then we apply pre-processing techniques to simplify the input. Here, this was the main idea of Strega. Instead of just working with the images, we would uh, work with a simplified form of the image. And here, that was uh, a segmentation of the brain. So different parts of the brain were segmented and supplied as different parts of the image in uh, instead of just uh, providing the intensity values. 
And then we had um, proposed here compact CEVAE model, which is a context encoding VAE model, but a compact version of it. What it does is uh, it receives this uh, simplified input and it tries to reconstruct the same input back. So here the idea is, of course, that we would like to learn how a healthy distribution looks like. So we would only supply healthy brain images during training. During inference, we will just supply, say, an uh, uh, image with a brain tumor, and the model will be able to uh, say where the brain tumor is. But why? Because the model never learned the distribution of unhealthy things. So the distribution that it has learned from the um, healthy images will not be sufficient to represent this unhealthy anomaly. And this also helps in a lot of ways. It's not just for the data set problem, but it's also difficult to represent all the anomalies that can occur in a human brain. So this also that um, it for any kind of anomaly because any disease can be treated as an anomaly. After the complex EVA model gives this prediction during inference, then we create the mask using certain post-processing steps like um, nulling out the values or negative values, then also thresholding, morphological opening, and then finally stacking them to get the final 3D mask. Now, let's have a look how it looks. It looks great somehow. If you think that the network never saw any example of how an anomaly is, on the final column, you can see the ground truth. And the pre-final column is what we got from the method. And for localization, it always worked. It always localized the anomaly. Of course, we see some under-segmentations. But given the network never saw any anomaly in its life, it actually did uh, quite a good job. So AI yeah, is great. It's perfect, right? But then why we, uh, we are even discussing the topic uh, of trust. It's perfect. We got lovely results. Let me just uh, raise the bar a little and start an alarm for you. Here is uh, another research of ours. It's about COVID classification using deep learning. Here we used uh, five different uh, state-of-the-art models, and we trained those models to uh, classify COVID and other uh, types of pneumonia. Now here, it's just a comparison of the number of trainable parameters we had in each models, like ResNet 18 being uh, the smallest one with around, uh, around 11 million, the Inception ResNet V2 with 54, and ResNet 161 with 26. Anyway, now if, uh, if you look at the results, so we classified the, the COVID and other tumors, it was a multi-class uh, classification problem. Then when we see the results, we see DenseNet, uh, had the best F1 score of 85%. Then we had uh, ResNet 18, the smallest model, got uh, an F1 of 82%. And we also created one ensemble of all the models which reached 87% of F1. Nice, really nice, no? But not really. If we now look at these models using um, some uh, technique like uh, occlusion, we see the reasonings of the model might not have been that good. And we also showed these results to uh, radiologists and um, neurologists, and then they also confirmed what we are um, about to tell you. The first thing on uh, here, you can see those white markings on the image on the left-hand side. Those are the annotations of the radiologists. DenseNet 161, which was actually the best performing model, has nothing to do with all those regions somehow. It just predicted something. It just uh, shows, okay, this is the most important part. Here we get the most feature from but it has nothing to do with the actual location of the pathology. And the second one, Inception V2, ooh, it thinks everything is important. Then goes, same goes for Inception V3. But now ResNet 18, which was actually our second best model in the mix, it shows locations which are very close to the ones which the radiologists also annotated. Then we have another image uh, on the bottom, also similar. Here, uh, the first image is before uh, COVID. So this person had no pathology at this time. But if you see how DenseNet 161 was focusing, it was actually focusing everywhere. And let me tell you, DenseNet 161 even uh, predicted it as COVID. Then we have ResNet 18, which is having less focus compared to ResNet, uh, DenseNet 161. 
Then if you go to the other days, this was of the same patient of different days. We had day three, seven, and nine. And we see the, how uh, the focus area changes. And when we showed these results to the radiologists, um, when they compared this, uh, what they saw in DENSNET-161 and uh, ResNet-18, they said, the ResNet-18's reasonings, of course, they're not always uh, what they're marking are not that uh, relevant, but definitely much more relevant compared to DENSNET-161. Now, you might say this is just like a few examples. It could be just like the worst ones. So we also did another uh, experiment with neuron activation profiles. And this is a global method. So it doesn't look at individual images, rather the whole distribution of um, the images and uh, represents in that manner. So neuron activation profiles, we actually see a similar story like what we were seeing uh, with occlusion. Here you can also see that uh, with uh, DenseNet, we have first the early layer results and the deep layer results. You see that it's not really focusing on um, giving importance on to regions where it's supposed to. Either it's completely distorted around the whole image or even uh, focusing uh, on the boundaries somehow doesn't make so much sense. And if you look at the deep layers one, oh, it's even bad. It's like almost has nothing to do with the lungs. So we actually expect to see something like a lung because that's where the disease should be but we don't even see that here. With the ResNet-18, we do see that. We do see that uh, the focus has been on the lungs. So the message here is that if we just compare our models with the different metrics like accuracy or in segmentation, let's say dice, that's not the whole story. We cannot just evaluate a model based on the performance in terms of classification or segmentation or reconstruction. We really need to dig deep to build actually the trust. Now. How do we trust them? We first saw really amazing results. Then we saw, again, really good results, but a problem with network's focus areas, problems with the reasonings. So how do we trust them? Here are a few ways that we can trust and how we should not surrender to the friends of Skynet. And how do we do that? The first thing is to use explainable models. But sometimes we can see that the explainable models maybe are not the ones giving the best results. Then we have options for applying post hoc methods for interpretability and explainability. Then we should also evaluate uncertainty of the model and to know like which parts of the data where the model might not be so sure when it's doing its job. And the fourth one is counterfactuals. I'll go into each of them a bit into detail with uh, basically by giving some examples. The first one, explainable classifier. We will still stick with our, our world of deep learning and try to have a model which is a bit more explainable compared to what typically we use. In this model or the GP models, as we call them, it was originally inspired by one of the work of one of our speakers from tomorrow, I think, Florian. And uh, in this GP unit model, the model from the model directly, we can get the heat map where we can actually see where the tumor is. So we can not only see that the model predicted something, whether there is a tumor or a type of tumor, but we also see where the tumor exactly is. This way, we can also show it to the decision maker and that can help more. So if we are just saying it's a type of high-grade glioma, but without looking at it, because we don't know exactly where it looked at. Maybe it mispredicted by focusing on the backside of the brain or something. But this actually helps us to tell that, okay, it's focused in a certain region to give its prediction. And we actually took it one step further. We then applied post-processing techniques on top of it to get a network-generated segmentation. So not only we have an explainable classifier, but we also have weakly supervised segmenter. But how is this model exactly working? So this is one of the models that we were experimenting with. And in this, this is a GP recon resident model. So it's a recon resident model that I mentioned earlier for reconstruction, but we just changed a little bit. We changed the final part. What we did, when we were doing training, we are applying after uh, the pre-final layer, we are applying an adaptive max pooling. And this adaptive max pooling just uh, merges everything into a one-dimensional array. And then that is then 
sent to the final convolution layer to get the prediction. And this way, we get a classification prediction. When the network is being trained, we just supply the classification labels, and this is how the network was trained. Once the training is done, if we want, again, the prediction in terms of the class, we would keep it just exactly as it is. But if you want to see the heat map, we will just remove this pooling layer, and then we can get the output as this generated heat map. And how were the results? First of all, we have uh, here I'm showing both uh, quantitative and qualitative. Let's start from the qualitative. You can see like we had th three models in our mix and everywhere we can see where the tumor is. So the model locates it for us. And this of course can be used to show it to the doctors that, hey, this is the type of tumor the model predicted. And this is where exactly it focused. So it helps uh, building trust in it. So they are not totally dealing with a complete black box anymore. And then when we apply the post-processing, we get the final column, the network mask, where it's actually segmenting the whole thing. And this way we can also generate the segmentations without having the need of using segmentation labels. Now in terms of accuracy, like we have the first two models, which are the typical black box models. We have Inception V3 and ResNex 50. We had an accuracy of 95. But with our GP models, the best model which performed gave an accuracy of 94. The other three gave 93. So in terms of accuracy, really, we compromised a bit. But it's about whether we go with just accuracy, but we saw that's, that's not the way to go. So instead of that, if we compromise a bit with the accuracy, maybe we get uh, the interpretation. So we know exactly where the model focused. And as an added bonus, after post-processing it, we also get the segmentation masks and we got the best segmentation of 67%. So we also got the segmentations without using the labels. Now, this, is, this was one example for explainable uh, classification. Now, how about post hoc methods? Because if you really would like to use the model with higher accuracy if there is a scenario where this kind of explainable models are not giving good results at all, and you have to go with uh, the black box model, then the idea can be to use post hoc methods. So for this, there are different methods, different research out there, but it might be always difficult to, in, uh, to implement or apply it to our models. So we developed one pipeline called Torch Esegeta. And in this pipeline, what do we do? We have our trained black box model and our input. We provide these to the Torch Esegeta pipeline. And the pipeline has a GUI and the whole uh, system is controlled with the JSON file. And then with while uh, executing, we actually unify different uh, interpretability techniques and explainability techniques from different packages even. And then the pipeline provides us with the interpretation and explanation of different things. Now, the results we saw for the COVID for um, interpretability, we also use the same Torch SG data for doing them. So, that's it, just to do uh, and just to see for the classification results? Not really. So we are also looking into other types of models with TOS data. And we extended the interpretability techniques and explainability techniques which are currently out there for segmentation models. And using that, we got some interesting results. We wanted to dig deep bit into the model itself of a segmentation. So for example, there is a model called unit MSS, multi-skill supervision unit. And we know, okay, this model gives good results and so on. But what is going on inside? Here, we actually can see, like in every layer, how the model focused in which region of the image. So this gives us a bit more information. This is nothing more like for trust building only, but it's this thing is more for us, for developers, to find out where we can improve the things and where we might be missing out on. And this is, uh, so this is the exact unit model. So just um, same shape has been followed here. So you can see where the, the deeper layers are focusing in this kind of manner, while uh, of course the earlier layers are focusing more like in a general way. Now let's go to uh, reconstruction. We talked about reconstruction model in the um, uh, earlier slides where we talk about recon rest night and NCC1701. And we also did uh, things with Torch data for reconstruction models. 
One was activation maximization. In this technique, we wanted to see what the model actually learned. In theory, of course, the model sees our images with artifact, predicts images without artifacts. But what was inside the model? What was the exact knowledge? Did it uh, remember how to remove artifacts? So how artifacts look like? Or it knew how a brain looked like? So it will just remove everything which is not a brain. So with activation maximization, we could uh, evaluate that. And we saw that we basically see a brain uh, inside the model. So the hypothesis of the original work um, was also the same, that the model learns um, the brain, uh, how a brain should be. And the artifact is basically the residuals. And this actually proves our hypothesis. Then we have another one, which is a bit more simpler one, just to see where the model gave most importance and was uh, with a modified version of saliency. And here, the model, uh, we saw that model gave most importance inside the brain, how we actually feel it should. It also supports the, the uh, hypothesis that no, it doesn't really care so much about the artifacts, but it, care, but it cares about bringing out the brain image from behind all the artifacts and everything. Now, let's move to the third one that I've mentioned, and that's the uncertainty. What's uncertainty? It's basically a technique to tell us which part or of the data or which part of the image the model is not sure about. For this task, what we use is a different model, also unit MSS-based model, but for undersampled uh, super resolution. So it was, we were super resolving or uh, improving the resolution of the image of the undersampled MRIs, which you saw at the very beginning. And how we typically evaluate. Typically, uh, when we are testing or we developed a model, we usually create a difference image. What's the difference image? We just subtract our original image and we have our ensembles. We just uh, uh, subtract the ensemble from the original and reconstruct it from original. Once we see the reconstructed for original, we get a difference image and looking at it, we can see where are the differences, like where the model did mistakes. So the second last row is exactly what this, uh, this difference image is. So we can see a few difference images here. Now, when we are uh, using the model in production, we don't have ground truth because we of course acquired only using uh, low resolution scans. So if we have low resolution scans, how do we uh, calculate the difference now? We cannot. So in that case, we can use uncertainty maps. And here, what you can see uh, on the bottom uh, row, it shows like where the model is not that sure. So for example, this white regions, which are like fluidic regions, in every case, the model was not so sure. And in the difference image, you also see the fluidic regions are also the brightest. Uh, so I'm talking about the second column. And you see the fluidic regions, they're really bright also in the difference as well as the uncertainty map. Same goes uh, for the other ones. The thing is, when we look at these maps, we know maybe these parts of the image, they are not trustworthy, they might be wrong. Maybe the rest, they are not that wrong. Now, another thing which we see here, that uh, here, all these columns, they're of different acceleration factors. So more right you go, you get faster. But if you look at what we get, we have a difference image which is really bright because it's really showing a lot of regions where the network wasn't really sure or wasn't really predicting correctly. And the uncertainty map also shows, yes, the network was uncertain about those regions. And it uh, also co corroborates well with the uh, quantitative evaluation. So the first three columns, you have a value called SSIM which is the structural similarity between the prediction and the original image. And we have something like always more than 90%, 95, 93, 90%. But the last two columns, we have like 82 and a bit more than 85%. And we can consider 90% as the threshold we can accept. So looking at the uncertainty maps, when we don't have the ground truth with us in production, just looking at the maps, we can say, yes, we should not use these models, at least with this kind of uh, acceleration factors, because higher acceleration factor means we have more artifacts, more noise in the image. And the network was not just capable enough to do that, to correct it. And this is how we can evaluate a model in the runtime. And in this way, we can build trust because 
There are methods like AI recon, which is an FDA approved uh, reconstruction method. Uh, and it's from GE and from General Electric, and they offer it in their scanners. But of course, if this model is there, people might doubt it because of if you have some higher acceleration and the model is failing, you just don't know the model is failing because you see a good image. Maybe it's fine, but maybe it's not. Looking at the uncertainty image, we can actually know maybe some parts are wrong or maybe the whole prediction is wrong or not good enough. So this also improves in terms of trust. The fourth one that I would like to talk about is counterfactuals. What's counterfactuals? Let's start with a simpler example before going into counterfactuals for images because mostly we are talking about images today, right? So you have a loan application, a bank receives a loan application, uses a machine learning model to predict, and the um, model says reject it. Once it rejects, the question comes, why was I rejected? What can I do to now get the approval? But the model never says that. The model says rejected. We can know it using something called counterfactual. With counterfactual, we basically ask the model back, hey, you rejected application. What we have to do to get it approved? And the model might say, or the counterfactual method might say, apply after six months and increment the salary by $2,000. Okay, that's doable. So the person can go back and uh, in, uh, after six months, after increment, he can come back for the um, uh, loan. And then the model will approve his loan. But when we do counterfactuals, they're not always something we can actually use. Say, for example, uh, the model might also say, apply after 100 years or increment your salary by $2 million, which are not really possible. So these are not plausible, but this is. And this is what is plausible counterfactuals. And we did one uh, plausible counterfactual experiment using GAN-based image generation. Here, the generator's job is to generate images and the classifier then sees these images along with the actual images. And the generator tries to uh, improve the images generating till the time and mo modify the input image till the time it gets an image which is of a different class. And we use the discriminator of the GAN for a plausibility loss. Because if we just give random images to the model or ask for different things, yeah, model might just give me inputs like this, um, like apply after 100 years. Not really possible. So this is where we have the plausibility loss. And this is done using the GAN-based discriminator. And these are some results. So we experimented with two different topics. We uh, used first data set was MNIST, which is handwritten digits. And the second one was brain tumor in MRI. The, if you see this one, this is like given image zero. And uh, we wanted to see you know, how this model you know, changes this image to a target class, which say one or two. And then you can see how it changes and predicts uh, some uh, like two or three from this model. And the idea here is we can try to make it more explainable when we impl uh, implement image registration to find a mapping between the given image and the predicted final plausible, plausible counterfactual. And then this way, we can then see that uh, what are the changes to do in the image to get our uh, final prediction. Then we have um, another example, which is with brain tumor, uh, brain tumor. And that's brain tumor in MRI. So on the left, we have the image, which is tumor-free, and that's the main input. And we ask the model, what will be a tumor for you? And a plausible tumor. And here, it uh, at this, close to the center, it tries to modify it to make it uh, look like a tumor, look like a lesion there. But yeah, of course, this uh, brain MRI is not perfect, but it's one step closer to understand how what to change in the image to make it a different class and to make it more explainable about um, what the model is trying to do with it. So in conclusion, AI is our friend. Not all AI is Skynet. Let's understand them better from explainable models to opening the black box. Thank you so much for your attention. And I'll leave you with this lovely picture of the Karina Nebula captured by JWST.